The MG3 is a super mini you probably won't have considered, yet it's fun to drive, practical to own, and vastly more affordable than the conventional choices in this segment. This revised version offers sharper looks, a smarter cabin, and improved media connectivity. If you don't need class leading efficiency and you're prepared to forgive a few rough edges in return for the big savings on offer, then it could rank as a very clever choice. There's something about the two letters MG that strikes a chord in the British consciousness. The brand, named after Morris Garages way back in 1924, has been part of our automotive heritage for nearly a century. And though its cars no longer roll down the Longbridge production line, they still have a distinctive appeal. Take this one, for example, a youthfully revised version of the MG3 Super Mini. Of course, MG is a very different company these days from the one that filed for bankruptcy back in 2005. Back then, the brand looked down and out, but in fact, a new future was just beginning. The Chinese were looking for a foothold in the Western market, and what was left of MG seemed tempting. In 2007, the country's oldest car maker, NAC, snapped up the business, and then two years later, merged with China's largest car producer, SAIC, who immediately announced plans to develop MG for the modern era. But into what? It's certainly taken time for things to get going. The brand's initial offering, the mid-sized MG6 of 2011, really wasn't up to much. Things improved though when the original version of this British-engineered MG3 Super Mini made its debut in late 2013, and the upward trends continued with the subsequent introduction of a couple of compact SUVs, the GS of 2016 and the ZS of 2017. The ZS was particularly well received, and it was a model responsible for boosting the brand's sales by 167% during its first 12 months on sale. Indeed, it's made MG this country's fastest growing automotive brand. That ZS SUV lends many of its features to the rejuvenated MG3 model we're going to test today. Now this Super Mini is no longer assembled in Britain, but it's still extremely affordable, offering Super Mini space for city car money. In terms of pricing, think around 25% less than most mainstream brand rivals. Yes, and you heard that right. Now this update uh, retains the previous 1.5 litre petrol engine, but it delivers sharper looks and a completely new cabin incorporating much improved media connectivity. This remains one of the most personalizable cars in the sector too, and it has a reputation for being one of the better ones to drive. There's also a standard seven year warranty in case you're worried about buying into an unfamiliar brand. Now, if you think all that sounds quite promising, then stay with us as we check this car out. Scroll back through history and you'll find that MG didn't only make roadsters, but also sporty saloons like the 1100 and 1300 models of the 60s. Those old models sold to family people who wanted a bit of extra spice in their morning commute. Exactly the customers that modern owners of this brand hope will be interested here. In referencing those old MG saloons, it's perhaps interesting to reflect that even back in the 60s, the A-series engines that wheezed away beneath their bonnets weren't exactly cutting edge in terms of technology, and so it is here. Forget modern advances like variable valve technology, uh, light pressure turbocharging, and direct injection. Those are things that are now commonplace on cars in the Super Mini segment. Instead, the only engine option here continues to be the old tech, chain-driven, normally aspirated 1.5 litre petrol unit that MG owners SAIC originally brought in from General Motors. As before though, a little compensation comes with the news that it develops a healthy 105 brake horsepower, substantially more than you get in the entry-level versions of other competing Super Minis. That means a reasonable turn of speed, something further aided by this model's relatively light 1.5 tonne curb weight. Rest to 62 miles an hour is achievable in 10.4 seconds on the way to 108 miles an hour top speed. To give you something to benchmark this against, uh, the kind of 70 brake horsepower Ford Fiesta that in base spec form would cost you nearly 5,000 pounds more than this car takes nearly 15 seconds to reach 62 miles an hour and can't top 100 miles an hour. 
power. Believe it or not, an equally pricey base spec 75 PS uh, five-door Vauxhall Corsa is even slower. Now, though it is true that most of this car is Chinese, many of the bits that really matter are British through and through. And that's an observation that's especially true when it comes to the elements concerned with ride and handling. Now, the MG3 was designed with the intention of being fun to drive, the chassis having been subjected to many thousands of miles of testing on European roads. MG was aware that for Europe, it would need a different spring and damping setup from that used in Asian markets. Markets, and the British development engineers have here produced a very good one. There are suppler riding cars in this class and there are more sportily suspended ones, but few models of this kind that we've tried manage to achieve a better combination of both attributes over good roads and bad. And now some buyers may feel the ride to be over firm, but it's nothing that you couldn't live with. And the sporting compensations are many, and not only when you're throwing the thing about. Uh, the front disc, rear drum brakes, for example, are responsive and powerful. Uh, so in short, there are few really inexpensive cars that we'd enjoy driving more than this one. The brand should offer an MG3 with another 50 brake horsepower in hot hatch guys. The basic vehicle dynamics and offer here are easily up to that and the model that would be created then would be a real hoot to drive. But even with only 105 braked horses to play with, in some respects uh, this car already is which for a first attempt in this segment is a pretty impressive achievement for the Longbridge based development team, especially given that the class in question contains models of the talent of Ford's Fiesta. Uh, they couldn't, of course, do much about the aging engine's relative lack of refinement. Uh, it does make a bit of a din during harsh acceleration and uh, motorway cruising refinement. Well, that's certainly well below the standards that are set by the class best. Still, in most other respects, uh, uh, the dynamics of this car represent a job well done. Body rolls well controlled, grip is prodigious, and there's better feedback through the steering than in some GTIs we've driven. That's primarily because uh, perhaps modern era electric steering still hasn't made it to MG yet. Now the downside of that is that the helm is heavy during parking maneuvers in the kind of urban environment where the option of an automatic gearbox would be nice to have. Now SAIC does offer that on this car in its home Chinese market, but not elsewhere. So buyers here are limited to a manual stick shift that has a slightly imprecise feel and only five speeds. That's a bit limiting on the highway. Still, it's unrealistic to expect too much for this kind of money. Overall, you can forgive this car much for its low price and for its chirpy driving dynamics. It's a fun steer, exactly as an MG should be. Is this the car that would have replaced the old Rover 25 had not that British brand floundered into bankruptcy in 2005? Well, perhaps. Certainly it was a shape created by many of the same talented Longbridge designers, uh, people who are now ensconced behind Chinese-owned CAD cam screens at the SAIC Design Centre in Longbridge. It uh, looks quite smart too. They're in a sort of generic way that would leave you scratching your head if, with badges removed, you were asked to place the manufacturer behind it. All the expected modern design cues are certainly present and correct. Uh, blacked out A-pillars, wraparound windscreen, uh, twinkling daytime running lights and sharply sculpted crease lines. In short, there's certainly nothing economy-minded about the way this thing looks especially in this revised form, which features this enlarged full-frame grille with its enlarged MG octagonal badge, bringing the styling into line with that of the brand's successful ZS SUV. Up close and personal, you find many of the styling cues first seen in the MG Zero concept car, which inspired the original version of this design, attempting to target young and style-conscious buyers who want an affordable super mini that's just a little bit different. Inevitably, the uh, production-ready look has been watered down a bit, but there's still enough individuality about it to interest the trendy, budget orientated fashionistas that MG hopes will want this car. People the brand thinks will want to personalize the look with a wide range of available bright and cheeky colors, exterior graphics, 
door mirror finishes and wheel designs, all apparently inspired by the British fashion industry. Now the look of this particular car is quite restrained, but if you are more of an extrovert sort, you might for example choose one of the brighter paint finishes, uh, Hello Yellow for instance, and then perhaps embellish it with white trophy stripes, and maybe also an orange sunburst coloured roof and silver mirror caps. Or perhaps not, but anyway, you get the idea. Whatever the finishing tinsel chosen, what it all boils down to is a five door only shape that, although it's acceptably compact, is a touch larger than the Fiesta sector norm, thanks to a slightly longer wheelbase than is typical for this kind of super mini. Uh, this is emphasized by short overhangs, plus a waist level crease that flows below the window line, and also by this lower concave shaped indentation which flows upwards from the front wheel arch. Avoid entry level trim, you get these smart 16 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, and this black insert strip to mark out the body coloured lower side sills. At the rear, MG has tinkered with things a bit. Uh, the tailgate and the bumper have both been restyled, but the high level vertical corner lamps remain much as before. Avoid entry level trim and you get this neat body coloured roof spoiler too. But none of that will matter much if inside this Anglo-Chinese model delivers the ambiance of an Armenian thrift store. That's the kind of thing that you found in the original version of this car and in earlier 21st century MGs. It doesn't. The brand seems wisely to have devoted nearly all of this facelift model's improvement budget to bringing the cabin up to date, and the efforts paid off. Uh, now, true, you still probably wouldn't think you were in a mainstream branded European or Japanese Super Mini, but it's hugely better than what's served up by this car's most direct budget brand rival, the Dacia Sandero. Now, part of that is due to more cohesive Europeanized design, and part of that relates to the fact that the Chinese bean counters are finally getting the idea that it doesn't do to try to make production cost savings in an area that's so crucial to the day-to-day -day experience of automotive ownership. Hence, for example, the black and grey trimming highlights, uh, the metallic tartan surface treatments and the white seat stitching of this plush variant. Uh, for this revised MG3, the primary change is the installation of a completely new dashboard, partly because the previous fascia looked very old hat, and partly because for this upgraded car, uh, the designers had to incorporate this new 8-inch centre dash colour touchscreen. Now, it's a display that offers quite a lot, but in our view needs a slightly easier operating interface. Uh, now, it comes standard, providing you avoid entry-level trim, and you have to have this if you're going to get things like a DAB digital radio and an Apple CarPlay feature which lets you duplicate smartphone functions onto the fascia screen and use your favourite apps. Unfortunately though there is no Android Auto compatibility so if you don't have an iPhone you'll be a bit stuck. Uh, you can't have navigation either except through your phone. Um, it's also likely you'd spend quite a long time with this car before realising that pressing this central silver button returns you to the home screen. What else? Uh, well, this freshly added three-spoke wheel looks and feels good. Uh, unfortunately, though, it only adjusts up and down for rake, not for reach, which can make it a bit difficult to find a truly comfortable driving position, particularly if you're in an entry-level Explore variant, which also lacks seat height adjustment. Uh, through this wheel, you view a pair of clearly designated red-tinged instrument dials, which is separated by a small red trip computer display. Sports seats with part leather trimming feature in this top exclusive model, or you might prefer to save a little and buy a mid-range Excite version and then put any extra cash towards personalising the cabin with extras like uh, red air vent surrounds, a sports pedal set and special door sill finishes. That'll distract your attention from the low cost scratchy plastics that become more in evidence the lower down the face you look. Uh, to be frank though, we're minded to overlook that given that this is the case with most contenders in the class, even some well above this car's affordable price point. Uh, this MG also offers reasonably decent cabin storage provision with big door bins, several rather small cup holders and a large glove box. Right, let's take a seat in the rear. Uh, 
headroom here is genuinely impressive and for this class of car there's a reasonable amount of legroom too thanks to the way that these front seat backs have been sculpted. A couple of six footers will be perfectly comfortable and three kids quite happy. Of course it's unrealistic to think of seating three adults here over long journeys. Apart from the relative narrowness of the cabin, the middle portion of this rear bench has an unyielding shape that isn't especially comfortable. Uh, but then you could say the same of virtually any of the more familiar super minis in this segment, uh, most of which are really significantly more cramped in the rear. Uh, seat back mat pockets are provided on this top exclusive version, but the lesser variants have to do without those. And out back, well, the boot isn't the biggest in the class, but it's certainly very class competitive. Uh, you'll get 256 litres if, as we would, you elect to carry a spare wheel rather than a silly little puncture repair kit. Otherwise, there's 285 litres on offer. Now, that's pretty much the same as you'll get with more familiar super mini models like Ford's Fiesta, uh, Vauxhall's Corsa and Peugeot's 208. Dacia's Sandero is the only rival offering significantly more, but we'd suggest that the shape of this boot is more practical. With the 60-40 split folding rear bench pushed forward, this MG shades even the Dacia, offering a class leading 1,262 litres of fresh air, although the space provided isn't uh, completely flat. It is impressively large though, not only 25% bigger than you'll get in a Ford Fiesta, but also nearly as large as what you'd find in a Ford Focus from that's class up. Uh, more than you'd bargain for then, uh, which sort of sums this car up. The MG3 range continues to be a simple one, a single five-door body style, a single 1.5-litre normally aspirated petrol engine, and a single transmission option, a five-speed manual gearbox. Uh, you'd expect this Chinese budget brand super mini model to be inexpensive, and it is. Uh, prices start from around £9,500 for the entry-level Explore variant. Now, that's about £800 more than the pre-facelifted MG3, but it's still exceptionally good value. Basically, you're getting a super mini shaped B segment Fiesta sized car for the price of a city car shaped A segment Volkswagen upsized model. And that's a decent deal in anyone's book. Now, predictably, MG dealers will tell you that hardly any customers for this car stick with entry level trim. The vast majority opt for either the mid range Excite variant, which from launch was priced from just under £11,500, or the top exclusive version that we're testing here, which at the introduction of this facelifted model was priced at around £12,800. Whatever derivative you favour, you might well be interested in MG's attractive finance terms on this car, a five year 0% APR finance package, which requires no customer deposit. In short, you can see why the NG brand is growing so quickly. Tight pricing is of course key to that. Essentially, this Anglo-Chinese manufacturer is offering buyers a new super mini for the price of a mainstream badge second-hand one. Now, only one other model in this segment also offers that kind of proposition, Dacia's Sandero. Now, for reference, if you were to order that model with the TCE 90 petrol engine that you need for direct comparison with this MG's 1.5 litre unit, you'd save only around 700 pounds over this MG and and you get yourself a far less sporty car. This MG3 won't make you feel like you've scrimped and saved when you park it in your driveway either. The Dacia probably might, and for quite a few potential buyers, that'll be a crucial difference. Everything else in the Super Mini segment, of course, costs much more. Uh, I think pricing starting at around £11,000 for a Mitsubishi Mirage and around £12,000 for a base Suzuki Swift, Kia Rio, Hyundai i20 or Citroen C3. About £13,000 would be required to get you the cheapest Skoda Fabia, Nissan Micra or Mazda 2. And around £13,500 to £14,000 will these days be needed for the cheapest versions of popular class contenders like Vauxhall Corsa, Ford's Fiesta, uh, Toyota's Yaris, Seat's Ibiza and the Renault Clio. 
Super Minis like Honda's Jazz and Volkswagen's Polo cost even more. And bear in mind too that all those prices only get you the car in question with a feeble entry-level engine. Choose a power plant with the performance to match this MG3's 1.5 litre 105 brake horsepower unit and you'd be looking at needing to pay much more. If having considered all of that and taken into account this car's frisky handling, you conclude that it is an MG3 that you really want in this segment, then you're not alone. The success of this car has made its maker the fastest growing brand on the market. And that's something certainly aided by strong equipment levels across the range. It is a pity that a space saver spare wheel costs extra, but otherwise most of the key things that you want come as standard. So let's start with entry-level Explore trim, which includes LED daytime running lights, Bluetooth for your phone, all-round electric windows, remote central locking, hill hold control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, uh, a USB port and a radio, although that only has a couple of speakers. Ideally though, you want to progress a little further up the MG3 lineup, possibly to the mid-range Excite variant. This will need to be your minimum starting point if you'd like what is arguably this facelifted model's most important feature, the revised cabin's eight inch center dash infotainment screen with its Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring capability. Now this monitor also includes a DAB tuner and it features volume controls off the steering wheel, which at this level in the range uh, comes with leather stitching. Other standard Excite spec features include 16 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, reverse parking sensors and a bit more street side presence courtesy of a rear spoiler, a lower black side sill insert and body coloured finish for the door handles and the mirrors. Inside uh, the audio system upgrades to four speakers and there's air conditioning with a dust and pollen filter. As you'd expect though, the real niceties are reserved for the top of the range variant, the MG3 exclusive, which is what we have here. This gives you all the Excite spec features, plus part leather trimmed sports seats, cruise control, a reversing camera, map pockets, and a further upgraded six speaker audio system. On to options and accessories. Now, one of the things that marks out the MG3 from other bargain brand models is the extent to which you can personalize it your own way. Uh, owners begin with a choice of six standard colors, Hello Yellow, uh, Spiced Orange, Laser Blue, Ruby Red, Aspen Silver, or as here, Arctic White. And then to these, they commonly add stripes or roof and bonnet graphics, apparently inspired by the UK fashion industry. Uh, from that starting point, there's the option of having alloy wheels finished in either high gloss black or white or with diamond cut styling. Uh, there's a red framed sports grille available and the door mirrors can be finished in silver, red, black or white. Inside you can add red air vent surrounds, a sports pedal set and special door sill finishes. Even the key fob can be colour specified in black or red. More practically, you can specify a spare wheel and add in mud guards. Uh, floor mats, a load space liner and door sill inserts can all be ordered separately or as part of a combined protection pack. A tow bar and roof bars can be specified separately or as part of an adventure pack. Now that also includes a load space liner and rubber floor mats. A cycle carrier can be added to a fitted tow bar or you could specify a cycle carrier for the roof. Uh, you might also be interested in a dog guard and possibly also in the headrest mounted tablet holder. That'd be ideal for keeping kids amused on longer journeys. And safety, well, you wouldn't expect camera-driven tech to be offered at this price point, nor is it. Uh, most of the basics are covered though, including Isofix charge seat fastenings, the provision of twin front side and curtain airbags, and the usual electronic assistance to try to make sure that you never have to use those. Uh, things like stability control and anti-lock brakes that are made more effective in emergency stops by a brake assist system. Uh, there are also features that you might not expect to find on this class of car, uh, things like tire pressure monitoring and a brake disc wiping system that in wet weather imperceptibly dabs the brake discs as you drive so that they're always primed and ready for effective action.
Of course, you can't have everything. Class leadingly low running costs and asking prices that read like misprints. Uh, the 1.5 litre petrol unit fitted to this MG3 represents the fruits of older technology. It lacks not only the turbo charging that most segment rivals use, but also a six speed gearbox. Uh, both things would do much to improve its efficiency. To be fair though, the brand has done its best to improve this engine in recent years. It's added a stop start system in 2015 and the more up to date engine management system which was necessary to meet the more stringent Euro 60 emission regulations. Unfortunately, those enhancements haven't been enough to allow this car to reach the prevailing class standard for efficiency. Uh, according to its maker, this model manages 47.1 mpg on the combined cycle and a CO2 emissions reading of 140 grams per kilometre. Those figures being the ones that uh, MG gave us calculated on the new WLTP cycle but converted back to the most recent NEDC2 spec since that's what a lot of rival models are still using. Uh, to give you some class perspective on that, a base 70 PS normally aspirated 1.1 litre Ford Fiesta manages 55.4 mpg and 115 grams per kilometre. If you were comparing against a more comparably performing Fiesta, uh, say a 1 litre EcoBoost model, uh, that manages 60.1 mpg and 106 grams per kilometre. So from that you can see the kind of thing that MG is up against here. This model's low upfront asking price will compensate for much of that, or at least it will, provided your point of comparison isn't a rival Dacia Sandero, which manages to be both cheaper and vastly less expensive to run. Uh, that Romanian competitor can't rival this MG's impressive seven-year, 80,000-mile warranty, though, which is fully transferable to any future owner. This kind of peace of mind, combined with MG's super affordable pricing, could be far more valuable than class leading efficiency for some potential low mileage buyers. Uh, you might be aware that uh, rivals Kia offer a seven year 100,000 mile package, but MG still reckons its deals preferable because it's backed by full factory support throughout, whereas direct manufacturer support for rival warranties declines the longer they go on. In many cases, they don't go on too long. In fact, many competitors still limit you to a three year backup package. Uh, a few do offer five five years. MG does better. This is a brand putting its money where its mouth is. And additionally, there's a six year factory warranty against rust uh, with a year's breakdown cover also included as part of the deal. What else? Um, well, service intervals are every year or 15,000 miles. Uh, at the time of the launch of this facelifted MG3 in late 2018, there were 96 MG dealers in the UK network and they can all offer you prepaid servicing plans provided by eDynamics so you can spread the cost of regular maintenance. Uh, insurance groupings are rated at 7E for Explore and Excite variants and 8E for this exclusive derivative, which is class competitive. Residual value well, they won't yet be up to those of mainstream maker models due to market uncertainty with the NG brand. Expect around 32.5% of your purchase price back after three years. Still, that could quickly change and owners will be well placed to benefit, providing they avoid dressing their cars up with leery optional graphics. Uh, finally, reliability should be good from the proven mechanicals. MG's modern era may have begun with the Chinese takeover in 2007, but in real terms, its future as a credible manufacturer actually started with this car, the MG3. It may not be the very cheapest super mini you can buy, but it's supremely affordable and it delivers far more character than its closest Dacia branded competitor for not much more money. The changes made to this revised model are welcome, primarily the sharper looks and the smarter cabin with its upgraded infotainment, but we are disappointed that cutting edge modern technology continues to be lacking beneath the bonnet. As before though, compensation comes with the sheer driving effervescence that continues the heritage of the MG brand. It's this, more than anything else, that gives this car the right to wear its famous octagonal badge with some sort of credibility. True, it isn't the most polished product, but then MGs never were. 
nor is it as thoroughly British as the maker would like us to believe. But its attractions are significant, with space, practicality, a fashionable feel and high equipment levels joining driving dynamics and outstanding value for money in the plus column. In its original form, this model struggled to shift more than a thousand units a year, but we predict this revised version will do considerably better than that. It is, in short, another truly class competitive modern era contender from this Chinese brand. A car that deserves to be taken seriously, and rather surprisingly, in every way that really matters, a proper MG.